And uh, if you want to have your Bibles open to Exodus chapter 33 and 34, we're going to be going around there. And I, I want to take time to really focus on uh, what this building theme means. And building a building really begins with plans, and it begins with a concept. And, and I've met many times with people because I built many buildings. It's in my DNA. Ever since I was a kid, I was raised on the job site with my dad, working on houses or building houses or building churches or doing this. I was kneeling off floors when I was, and we didn't have nail guns. So it was like the set in, set in. Well, I've sat with many people over the years as I've worked on concepts for them as if they wanted to build a house or they want to make changes. And when we go, usually it starts out sort of like Jim's cabin did. They wanted a cabin up in their mountains. So Nancy and I are sitting down at Ma's at Lawn one day and we have a napkin and we're writing on the napkin, sort of a drawing, right? It starts with a concept. Now, if you look at their cabin up there, I wish I had some pictures. It's a beautiful barn style cabin and it's gorgeous inside and it's in a beautiful setting. So at first it was a concept before it became a plan. So the first part we're going to be talking about for a couple of weeks is concept. And this is the big idea I want for us to get across today, that you cannot get closer to God than what your concept of God will allow. You cannot get closer to God than what your concept of him will allow. If you don't believe that God loves you, friends, you'll never approach him. You'll always stand at a distance. Even though Hebrews tells us that we can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence, we may stand back and say, wait a minute, I don't, that's not the God that I've really known. That's not the God that I knew, but I want you to know something very important that we, this morning, that we need to do is we need to remove a lot of the filters that we've had. By the way, take advantage of all of the apps and stuff we have on For Abundant Life. You can fill out this outline on your phone. Did you know that? That's pretty cool. You can give on your phone too. You can watch last week's sermon on your phone. You can do all kinds of stuff with your phone. Anyway, <laughs> sideline. That's just an advertisement. It's free. You don't have to give extra in the offering or anything or smile at me extra more. That'd be fine enough. Anyway. First of all, there's a great conception of God we need to understand. God is good. God is good. Psalm 86.5 says, For you, Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Psalm 31.19, How abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. Psalm 33.5, He loves righteousness and justice. And the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. God is good. Yes. By comparison, we inherently are not good. In fact, we're evil. Remember the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, you know, I, I, I've done all these things that you've asked me to do. And then Jesus asked him to do something hard. And he says, he hangs his head and walks off because he, he, something in him w was evil. We are evil compared to God. In fact, Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says, if you then, who are evil? He says, he says it right there. If you then, Matthew 7, 11, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Who, uh, those of us who are evil? That's not good. In fact, Romans 3, 12 says, all have turned aside. The word all. Uh, we, we have become worthless together, the Bible says. Paul writes, no one does good, not even one. In comparison to God, we are evil. Now, I love my kids. I, I love being a parent. I was loved by my parents. Um, my mom is here today, and in uh, my teenage years, I, I struggle with a lot of things like no other teenagers do. But at, her, at, at basketball games, I'd be out there, you know, when I was 14 years old, I was about six foot tall, all arms and legs. I mean, I was about as coordinated as nothing, right? And I'm out there running the basketball court, and then, well, who's in the stands yelling? My mom. She was the loudest one. She was. I mean, she just screaming, yeah, go, Larry, go, go. Who is that? That's my mom. <laughs> I think that there's something really important to understand, and it's a very biblical concept I want to communicate to us today, that our concept of God is developed by our parentage more than anybody else in this world. The best parent on the planet as scripture just told us, is evil, though, compared to God. Come on now. So our concepts are really important. Even though you're evil, the Bible says, you give good gifts to your children. Remember in Genesis 1, God created Adam and Eve in his image. They were to be what? The image bearers of God to their children. 
in every way. Anything that parents do that is good, we naturally attribute to God. Anything that they do wrong, we often inherently, instinctively, we attribute that to God as well. I am reading a book, I'm about halfway done, and it's, it's a chilling book. It's called Faith of the Fatherless by Paul Vitz. And in this book, he starts way back with Nietzsche, you know, all the way through contemporaneous, contemporaneous uh, uh, atheists, you know, um, Richard Dawkins and uh, also, oh, some of these guys like that. And he, he communicates every single one of them had an issue with their father, every single one of them. Every single one of them, in fact, for the most part, hated their fathers. Or they had an image of their father that they carried over into their translation of who God was. And God says, wait a minute, I'm different than that. The entire population of the world was destroyed and saved only one family? Why? Because they were evil. As parents, we bear the image of God to our kids. And by, by the way, we need to be compassionate and forgiving toward our parents because we're all in the same boat, right? So we need to forgive them. If you had abusive parents or times were rough, you need to forgive them. You need to get on with that and go on because God has something better. But the number one responsibility of parents, though, is to lead our children into under, in the understanding of God. And the most important thing that parents can do is to lead our children to, to God so that they can begin to have a relationship with him personally. I grew up watching my mom and dad experiencing God, and that led me to wanting to experience God. And also watching my dad, perhaps, in some of his less flattering moments, as we all have them, led me to having many more less flattering moments in life. But we as parents, as, as authorities, bear the image of God. And, and never underestimate the power of parentage as it shapes our image of God very clearly. Because of my parents, my ideas about God were shaped early on and by watching them worship, watching them give, watching them serve, watching them be faithful, and, and watching them endure. In an early age, I was introduced to God, and I took advantage of that introduction to know God. And, and, and unfortunately, I did. My parents, they weren't perfect. They were imperfect, like all of us. However, they introduced me to God, and because of that introduction, my image of God began to unfold differently than I think many do in this world. Any of the unflattering parts of my parents, as with many parents or all parents, I carried with me as well. Those were the hardest things to overcome because they also gave an impression on me about, what the, about, about a God and those impressions had to be broken. That had to change. And, and it took some time and it takes some time. One of my very best friends on the planet was raised in a home um, he loved God. He worshiped God. He was on the front row in every church service. He's just, just diving into Jesus. He, he was in Bible quiz. He, he's a fantastic man of God. He's a pastor to this day. He was raised in the home with a mom who loved God, but a dad who was an alcoholic father. He was verbally abusive. He was, a, he was absent. He was never very responsible. But nonetheless, because he got a hold of who God was early on, God was able to minister into his life and change the filters that he had in his life. And this is really important, friends, because there's something I need, I want for us to understand today. And the reason that we didn't have prayer earlier is that I'm going to make an invitation at the end of this service. And we're going to pray about having a personal understanding from God. The only way of understanding God is a direct revelation of God. We need a direct revelation of God. In Exodus 33, I think that's in your outline. I'm not sure. In Exodus 33, though, God is at a crossroads with Israel. And in the chapter before, Moses is on Mount Sinai for 40 days. He's on Mount Sinai for 40 days, and Aaron was in charge and, and thought that Moses was dead. Remember? He, he goes up, thinks that Moses is gone for 40 days. He's dead. So what does he do? He tells people to take off your earrings, take off your gold, and he melts it down and makes a golden calf. The Bible says that Aaron shapes the calf with his own hands. And it's so funny because Moses comes back down. And read it in your Bible. Moses comes down and checks on what's going on. And obviously, it's not good. And, and Aaron makes an excuse. He said, I don't know what happened. I got the gold from the people. I threw it in the fire. And the Bible literally says it out pop this calf. Come on. But in Exodus 33, God's at a crossroads with Israel. All of this has happened and Aaron's in charge and, and, and Moses comes down, as you know, and throws the commandments. And God says something while he's still on the mountain. God's telling him what they're doing down there. And he, he, he tells him that he's upset with him and he calls him stiff-necked. Then God tells Moses, he says, now I'll honor my word to them and I will take them into the promised land. 
But he says, my intimate presence with them, my side by side is, is not going to stay like it was because if it were, I would consume them. Are you catching that? That God is so frustrated with them. It's very interesting. Parents never get frustrated with their children, ever. I mean, we never do, right? Well, here God is a, a parent and he's getting frustrated with his children, but we still love our children, right? But God, God reveals himself to Moses and teaches us about direct revelation. So Moses this morning is going to be our preacher. He is going to be telling us four things that God led him through in order to have a direct revelation of God. Having a personal revelation of God is what transforms our understanding of who God really is. And this is the missing element because a genuine spiritual revelation spurns radical life change. It really does. And, and I want to invite us today to go on this journey. That was just the introduction. I'm getting warmed up, okay? Uh, if you're not used to a long preacher, uh, say, stand up for a while if you want. It really don't, it doesn't matter. You can, you know, whatever. Just don't leave. We don't, we don't want you to leave. Okay. I want to invite us today by the presence of the Holy Spirit to genuinely remove some filters we may have and experience God by the power of his spirit for who he really is. There's four steps that Moses went through to get a revelation of who God really is. And here's what Moses would say to us today. Number one, ditch the misrepresentation of God's reputation. Ditch it. Exodus 33.1. Look at this scripture with me. Very interesting. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you along the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, excuse me, say to the people of Israel, you are stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Fine. I said I'll take you to the playground where all the bullies are. But I'm not happy about it. I can see a parent in their minivan right now full of children. I'm taking you to the playground. I'm going to take care of the bullies. But I'm not happy about it. So what are the kids doing? They're sitting there like, okay. So they're in the back of the minivan. They're sheepishly quiet because what's happening? They don't know that what their parent's going to do next. You want me to pull this car over and make you get a switch? Some of the younger generation are like, was that a Nintendo? Or, I mean, no, it's not a Nintendo. It's, it's, it's a switch. It's a, it's a switch, you know. You think I'm cutting a switch? You think I'm playing video games? I mean, that's a different generation, right? I think, though, that there's something really crucial to understand here as we look at the children of Israel and God. God and them have really not gotten along since the first day they met. I mean, when God came to Moses and called him to deliver Israel, Moses says no. And then God gets upset with him later because he refuses to circumcise his own son. And this is the frustration between God and, 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 and them. The Israel would be complaining against God since the first day they were in the wilderness. And every time there isn't water, every time there isn't food, they're complaining. And, and they're in the back seat. I'm thirsty. How long till we get there? He touched me. He touched me. How long? Are we there yet? God saying... <laughs> Why would Moses, though, mistrust God like he did so much? Well, let's look at Moses' father. Who was he? Well, he was some Jewish guy. Consider where Moses has come from. Consider his whole life. In Exodus chapter 1, a pharaoh arose. The Bible says that knew not Joseph. And Joseph had delivered the, uh, the, the tribe of Israel, and they had grown in number in Egypt. And now Pharaoh's afraid because there's so many of them, so he's kicking them out. He's putting them to death, actually, at this point. And so he puts all the, 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 the children to death. He throws them in the Nile River. So what, is, what does Moses' mother do? He go, she goes and she takes him, puts him in a basket, floats him in the river. He's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So she takes Moses into Pharaoh's home, into Pharaoh's home. This is his image, right? Now who's the father figure in Moses' life? 
The daughter brings him into an environment where this man tried to kill him when he was a baby and later tries to kill him when he's 40. I mean, that's a real positive influence. What an image, right? And the gods of Egypt were to be feared. I mean, you sacrificed your children to them. You, you had to cut yourself and shed your own blood and burn sacrifices of, of parts of your body and have things cut off and, and all kinds of weird stuff. And there's a growing image in Moses' life that is crafted by this environment. These are the gods that he is subject to. The gods of Egypt ruled in occultic practices and ritualistic homages. And so Moses really doesn't have any idea of a personal loving God. He, he really, if we really put him in context, many people don't think about this part, but he really doesn't, all he has is the reputation, right? They had the reputation. The Bible isn't written yet. Moses is the one who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? I mean, we know he's the one that all of this uh, passed on uh, verbal uh, communication that had meticulously given, been given. They knew of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. They had a detailed account of creation. All of this thing had been passed down by oral tradition, but they really didn't have a comprehension of who God was, only who, who he is, only who he was. So a loving God hears their cries in Egypt as they're under slavery now. And scripture says that God hears them and, and he's, he mo he's moved by them. So he sends them a deliverer and he comes to Moses. And Moses at this point has fled Egypt because of something that he had done. And he's in Egypt and he's afraid. So, so God shows up to him in a, in a burning bush and he says, I want you to go. And Moses is like, I'm not going. I, I can't talk. I mean, who am I? I? I'm like a political candidate these days. I, can, I can't say anything right. I, so God sends Aaron to go with them. And the entire time that God is trying to get them out of Egypt, they're complaining against God. They really don't know God or, or only his misrepresented reputation that had become liturgical and very dry. And let me tell you this. Being in church and even being a pastor, being in the same modus operandi maybe that we do from time to time or all the time can make us feel like church and our spiritual life is only liturgical and dry. It's like we've only heard about what God used to do rather than what he's doing. So I invite you today by the power of the Holy Spirit as I have prayed for this meeting all week that we would step into a personal revelation today of who God is. Outside of what we've known, next week as we start really some apologetic arguments concerning creation versus atheism and all kinds of things because of what? Because of the concept of God has been so skewed in culture, I think our eyes and spirits are going to be encouraged all the more to exalt the one who gave his life for us. I want us to hear this. So they're all stiff-necked, and they're, they're, uh, God calls them stiff-necked. They, don't, they really don't know who he is. A lot of the resistance that we have toward what God is doing in life is because we really don't know his heart. You see, Moses had done more miracles than any man alive, but he didn't know God. Why? Because the example came from a reputation only from his upbringing. He, 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 he only saw harshness in his environment that was hostile, hostile toward the gods of Egypt, a, a father that really had no indication of the God of Israel at all. God's power was a distant, dusty history that he never really knew personally. He only heard about. And how many today, we're drudging forth and we're going in our Christian walk or we're coming to church out of some obligation or habit rather than to experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and to have a direct revelation of God. Let me tell you something something. The Bible is fantastic. We ought to know it cover to cover, but it is only an introduction. And I say only to the creator of the universe, the almighty God, the everlasting father, the one who designed every molecule of your body and put you together even before your mother and father had a sparkle in their eye. So the first thing that Moses would say to us is tear down the misrepresentation of God's reputation and see him as he is. Secondly, Moses would say, ask God to reveal his glory to you. Now look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. And he said, this is God speaking to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So Moses asked to see God's glory. Why did he do that? Because I got to think 
that a lot of things are really puzzling to Moses right now. He, there's some things not co quite computing. He gets this revelation of God, and God's saying he'll do this and he'll do that, but everything he's heard about what God did in the past, now he's trying to, to make it justify with everything that he knows of him in the future, and he doesn't know God. This is, this is something new. This is different territory. Even his in-laws aren't serving the God of Israel. So we have all of this kind of stuff that's like floating around in Moses' brain, and a lot of times we don't see him that way at this point, but this is who he is. This is the guy. Moses realizes there's something not computing. God who he is seeming to be is not the God that I've experienced because I really haven't had an experience. He's missing something about understanding who God really is. So what is glory? Moses says, show me your glory. Well, glory is what you're famous for and the essence of your character. So Moses wants to know God. So we should ask God to us personally, Lord, reveal your glory. When was the last time that you stopped and said, God, show me your glory? God, show me your glory. All the trials and difficulties and things that I have in this life, Lord, I just want to see your glory. Thirdly, Moses would say, set aside preconceived notions and experience God as he truly is. Now, this next scripture is so powerful. I have exploded it all over the place. So I hope that we're ready here this morning. I, I, I've, this point is so incredibly uh, important and because it's not man telling us about who God is. Oftentimes in scripture, people are talking and they give a representation of what happened to them or, or how God has changed them or what God did in their life. This is one of the places in the Bible where God says who he is himself without man's intervention. Now, verse 5, Exodus 34, verse 5. Look at this. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. He spoke boldly, in other words. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but all who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Wow. God reveals himself to Moses. And he says, Moses, there are seven things about me that I want you to realize. That I really, really, I, get, I want you to get rid of all your pre preconceived notions, Moses, about who I am. I know you've been raised in church your whole life, and you know when to get excited, when to sit down, when to clap, and when to do all these things. Moses, I know you know the tradition of what I used to do, but Moses, I want to show you who I really am. Don't you think the church needs that today? This is preaching. I mean, I don't care about those guys on TV and stuff. This is preaching, right? <laughs> Good job, Pastor. Well, thank you very much. Facetious, of course. First thing God says on this list is, I am merciful. God says he is merciful. And God doesn't lie. So he comes to Moses and says the first thing, and mercy is undeserved compassion that desires to help. Did you know that God not only sees what and you, you are and what you're doing in life, but he wants to help? Have you considered God on this level? God knows that the devil attacks against us. He knows the corruption of the world that's all around you. He knows the pressures that you feel to, to compromise. God just doesn't see the things in your life that are, are, are all wrong, friends. Sometimes we, maybe we've come to believe that God is like this, but the first thing God says, he says, hey, I, I see the pain of your past. I know the hand you've been dealt with in life. This is a merciful God. He is compassionate. I met a guy at a pastor's meeting one time, and he was, he was kind of a suspicious character, and he, would, he, he was, you know, very odd, and, and everybody would say, you know, he's, he's kind of odd, he's kind of odd. And, and so he was coming in for a while, and his, his, I got to know him, and, and I, I met with him and his wife. I had learned that he had had uh, prostate cancer. And it was very serious, and he had surgery and things like that. And, and after I had understood where he was at in life and what impact that had on a man, I had great compassion. It changed how I saw him. 
Other people would say, man, he's, he's kind of odd. That guy, he's, he's strange. He's, he's kind of weird. And I saw him, and I thought to myself, how could he be so normal? Why? Because I knew, I understood. I've worked with people that people said, how come you have that person working for you? They're so impersonal and all this stuff. I know their story. And I had compassion on them. God is compassionate. By compassion, by comparison, I am not. I am not compassionate. After uh, I saw, uh, or after we see people in, in a certain way, we judge them. But God says, I am merciful. He says to them, the reason that you guys don't understand me is that you have never really known me. You have only known about me, he says. I'm unlike other gods. Don't compare me with the gods of this world. Don't compare me with the attitudes of anybody. Don't compare me with yesterday's preaching that you heard. Only compare me with me. Hebrews 4, 14, the scripture goes down and says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, he says, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God is merciful. Gracious, he says, number two, I am merciful, Moses, and I am gracious. Grace means free help on every level that is, grant, that is granted without merit or our performance. Grace, I have an acrostic here of the word. Here comes God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Mercy is not getting something that you deserve based on compassion. But grace is giving you everything that you don't deserve based on God's grace and merit. Mercy is God's emotional response toward us. Well, well, grace is God's willingness to do for us based on his compassion and mercy for us. God is able to make all grace abound to you. I want to tell you some things this morning that you as a believer in this life have an incredible advantage of because of God's grace. Did you know that God will give you grace to have mental grace? The Bible says in John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. We have weak minds. I know that I do. That's just the way that it is. But the Holy Spirit can teach us things that we don't even know. Did you know this? That there are things that we can't even understand. I've been in situations where I didn't know what to do and I have prayed and the Holy Spirit has given me insight into something to know how to do it beyond my ability to do. I, I'm telling you, a relationship with the Holy Spirit does this because God has given him to us today. Did you know that God will give you physical grace for those of you that are suffering and say, I don't understand why I'm not healed. I don't understand what I'm going through. Do you realize that Christ has been there too? He has suffered just as you were. And Romans chapter 8 verse 11 basically says, if, if he who raised Christ from the grave, then think about how much more he can do for you. God will give us emotional grace. Galatians 5.22, the list of the fruits of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, kindness, meekness, faith. All of these things are the things that the Holy Spirit does. God can give us um, emotional grace. When we are feeling desperate, when we are feeling lonely, He can strengthen those cords up. God can do those things. He supports that. Did you know He can give you spiritual grace? Acts 1.8, uh, 8, the Bible says He will give you power when the Holy Spirit comes on you spiritual power to see great things accomplished for God and in your life. Did you know that he gives financial grace? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's taking an offering. He's always taking an offering in Corinthians. I mean, Corinth, the church in Corinth is like a church gone wild, right? And he's taking an offering and he says, you know what? When you give or you do this, when you are trusting God with your money, then I'm going to make all grace. God will make all grace abound to you, he says. Believing in Jesus is necessary for salvation, but our faith acts on these things. Yeah. Our faith is what says, God, I'm trusting you because your grace is bigger than what I could ever conceive. I've never heard anybody say to God, God, stop blessing me. God, I can't take no more. God, I'm at my wits end. I've got too much goodness in my life. When I exercise faith, I'm saying to God, God, I'm trusting you for things in life. I'm asking you for emotional grace, spiritual, physical, and financial grace. I understand that God is a loving father and a gracious father that loves to give gifts to his children. Get this, friends. God identifies himself as a parent. He does. He identifies himself with being a parent who loves his children. And are you exercising your faith by reaching out to your loving parent? 
Are you exercising your faith by reaching out to your loving <coughs> parent? The next thing God says, he says, I'm long-suffering. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Did you know that God is willing to suffer a long time on your behalf? He is willing to wait. On your worst day, friends, God is your best friend. When you dive into that familiar sin, God doesn't leave you. When you have lost every battle in a horrible way, God won't leave you. When you fail time and time again, God will suffer long for you. When your addiction rears its ugly head and comes back to haunt you, God is always there. Many have this idea, I think that we believe in, many of us that have been raised in church may have been taught it that when I feel God's disappointment toward me is, is so great that, that I don't feel like I can face God. And we beat ourselves black and blue and over and over again because we, we think that the, because our concept of God has been taught in this, for some reason we're hard on ourselves. And this is something in my life that I've struggled with. I, I have to admit, I have seen those close to me in my life from time to time and do the same things. And I, I caught that and I've amplified it in my own life. And, and what does that do? It makes me think that God thinks that way as well. And the Bible says, no, I don't. Do you honestly think you have done anything so bad that God doesn't love you? It's not possible. It's not true. It's wrong. It's a lie. So here's the truth again. I'm evil. God is not. By comparison, my best things are not even close. God is long-suffering. I am not. God is patient. I am not. God says, I will never forsake you. He is not frustrated with you. Let me tell you something. This is going to be a revelation to you for some of you. Here it goes. As the day is long, I want you to know something. He knew you were a long project when you met him. <laughs> he knew you would take some time. God will not give up on you or get angry with you. When everyone walks away, God will stand with you. He is long-suffering. Yeah. What else does God say about himself? He says, I am abounding in goodness. God is always good in every situation. He has no bad days and God has no bad moods. If you were raised in a moody environment, you might think that God is schizo, but God is not schizo. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, says, every thought that God has toward me is good all the time. Good all the time. Even though I am bad and ugly and wrong and misguided and all this stuff, God's thoughts towards me is good all the time. It's not dependent on your ability to be good. You can't perform it. What else does he say? He says, fifthly, I'm abounding in truth. God never lies, deceives, breaks promises, or in any way misrepresents himself in dealing with anybody. God not only does what is true, he is truth. In fact, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He will never break a promise to you. God will never, never break a promise to you. Six, he is forgiving. God says, I will always forgive and keep no record of wrong. Wow. I wish I had that ability. That means God is good, right? How many times should I forgive my brother? Peter asked seven times. He was probably discussing with one of the disciples. Uh, he, he fed a, the one of the, James got on his nerve because you know what? Every time we get off the boat, James doesn't fold the nets right. He starts with the wrong end. Drives me bananas. So Peter's like, Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus said 70 times. In other words, always forgive. Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove your transgression from you. There's no touching the east and west. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And God is just. Number seven, God rules and there are consequences for us when we violate God's rules. But God is gracious and forgives no matter what. He's a loving father. Hebrews 12, 7 and 9 tells us that he disciplines us as a son that he loves. He disciplines us in love. This is different than judgment that comes on unbelievers in eternity, friends. I think we need to understand this. We don't suffer that way because we are his sons and daughters. We receive our discipline right now while we're living for him. So friends, God is merciful, he's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's, he's, he's good, he's true, and he's just. That's your God. That's your God. Notice truth and, and, and just are just two out of the seven. God begins with mercy and grace and long-suffering. 
Do you have that image of God? Is your image of God that he's ready to crush you when you fail? Do you retreat so badly when you sin into a dark hole that you think God is ready to crush you? I gotta tell you, friends, that is a misconception of God we need to get over. God is gracious toward you. You are harder on yourself than God is. If we see how God really is, it changes our concept of him. According to his own definition then of these seven things, if we had our druthers, can I say that in the north, northwest? Uh, if we'd had our druthers, if we would rather in this life, we'd be sitting right in his lap because that's the kind of person that he is. We have the same problem, I think, in our culture that Moses had. Our concept of his is only as good as our history or the reputation or our earthly parents are. We believe he is what pop culture says that he is. When revelation hits us, that's when we're really free. Now hang on with me. I'm gonna go a little overtime today. Many years ago, about 1999 and 2000, I was pastoring this church here. I've been here, this August will be 25 years. I've been here a little while. Most of that time I worked another job at the same time. And, but during one portion of time, about 99, 2000-ish, about 99, there was some contention going on with me and some people in our church. And it was very difficult. And it came to a point where I was trying to please everybody. When I came to be the pastor at Abundant Life, I was 26 years old. Remember? Yeah. I was 26 years old. I was good looking too. <laughs> I don't know what has happened, but Brandon was three months old. And he's sitting up there in the balcony, married and joyful and And it was so difficult at one point, I, it was back in the days where I used to wear a coat and tie and look all pastoral. I was told, in fact, at one point that I looked like a pastor because I wore a suit to church. So I'm in the, up in my little bathroom in my office, which is two foot nothing square, and I'm standing in there and I'm trying to tie my tie and I, I am so stressed out, I cannot tie my tie. To make matters worse, I called a board member and another one to come in and pray for me that morning because of all the things that, and you know what's so funny? I, I don't do this anymore. I, I don't take things personal like I did. You know, I, I still do some. I'm, I'm just a person, but man, I used to take things so personal. And, and it would get to me and it would grind at me. And, and I came to a point where I was so stressed out. Uh, not only does the church have no money, I'm trying to, to raise a family. I'm trying to survive. And now at this point, I've got a couple of kids. And, and I'm trying to provide for everything. I'm trying to make sure the church is taken care of. I'm signing over my secular paychecks to the church uh, so that we can have money to survive here. And this whole time I'm working and doing all this thing and these people and all this contention, when you're a young pastor, people come in because they can just run right over you. They do. And I came to a point where I could not tie my tie and they came in and there was no compassion from them whatsoever. They couldn't understand because I couldn't tell them. It was a secret. It was things I had to bear. Now, what happened was in October of 2001, God set me free. And he set me free this way. I was in the sanctuary here and I was praying and I had a revelation of God. I, I had been preaching the do's and don'ts and the, the requirements and all the things that would draw all the homeschool people. I homeschooled my kids, so that's not a knock against homeschooling. In fact, I think it's the best way. Nonetheless, people can do what God has gifted them to do. But I drew this crowd of people that all thought that way. And I, I had to break the chain of that legalistic thinking. I had to break the chain of, of, of all of the rules and do's and don'ts. And all of a sudden, I became the realization, hit me in the face, and hit me in the nose so hard. I came to this realization that there's nothing I can do to make God happy. God's already happy with me. I can't make him love me any better because I act right. 
I can't make him have more compassion on me because I pay my tithes. I can't make him give me a, a, a better, uh, no, I, I can't make his impression of me anymore because I don't do whatever all the bad people are doing. I can't do one thing to make God love me. And I was so frustrated because I liked that. <coughs> That's where the money was. But when I laid it down, there was an inrush of the Holy Spirit that came into this body threatening to become a corpse, and I became alive. Now, that revelation was so important to me, and since then I've had other moments. But Moses went through one last change before all of this was over. Remember, he started out only relaying, relating to God by what he knew of God's past. But then God gives him a mandate and he's confused about who God is and he asks God to reveal himself and reveal his glory so God does it. So he tries to quantify the concepts of God with reality that he was experiencing. He needs clarification. Then thirdly, he reveals himself to Moses and Moses changes. Now, this is really huge. This next scripture should blow our minds right out of the water. As God, soon as God finishes telling Moses about who he really is, look at the Moses' advice to us. Number four, respond to who God really is. What did Moses do? Number one, he worshiped God. Verse 8 of chapter 34, and Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. If you could see how God really is, friend, you and I, we would worship. We wor wouldn't worship God because it's the right thing to do or we're in the habit of doing or the music makes us feel good. I mean, I feel good when I hear uh, somebody sing the Star Spangled Banner for crying out loud. <clears throat> but worship comes from a place that says, God, I realize how good you are, how merciful you are, how long-suffering you are, how compassionate you are, how just and true that you are, that I can't do anything else but worship. If you worship God based upon his performance or, or who, the, what he can do, we've missed the point. We worship him for who he is, <clears throat> the awesomeness of who God is. Notice something about this scripture. This is the first time Moses has worshiped. <laughs> that hit me like a ton of bricks. This is the first time he's worshiped. The first time he worships is after God shows to him his glory. The second thing that he did, he gained a new self-worth. In verse 9 of 34, it says, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, Please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Notice the words, I, Lord, take us for an inheritance. Now Moses identifies <coughs> himself with a value to God. And riddle me this, friends. If an entire generation of young people, kids in, in the Western world, and in America especially, believe that they came from monkeys, now hang on with me right here for a minute, how much value do you think they derive from that? In other words, that there is no, there is nothing that's sacred. There's, you, you're an accident and you came, you're headed toward an accident. There's nothing sacred, nothing in any way about your existence in this world or being an image bearer of God. You are just a mistake and mistakes have, uh, they're just going to be a mistake. And because you came from a monkey, that's, that's your, you're a mistake rather than believing that we came from an, an amazing creator who is merciful and gracious and long suffering. We think that we are an error. We think that we're here by accident. We think that a bunch of goo came. Well, God is creator. We're not a blob. Moses got a new thing it happened. He, he became identified. He, he has a new identity in God. Third thing, his witness changed. Verse 29, chapter 34. Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. As he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Now his face is shining. He looks a little different. The first time he comes down, his face didn't glow. His face didn't shine. What happened this time? He really knows God. He changed his witness. The biggest indicator of a lack of revelation, and I hope we hear this in love, is being ashamed of Jesus or the gospel. After my encounter with God, my countenance changed, my image changed, the church changed, my preaching changed. I had a grasp of grace. I understood grace better. There's not one thing I can do to earn it. There was a new joy, no longer bound by religious do's and don'ts. 
unlike what the Pope said this week, if you don't share God, you really don't know Him. Amen. Come on. He said it. You need and I need a personal revelation. When we know God out of works or legalism, we're sheepish or just our head knowledge. And I'm here to tell you that there's, there's a goodness about God that we miss in today's contemporary church culture. And that is the, the presence of God's Holy Spirit to speak to our lives and to speak into our lives and to communicate with us his love. We want people to know him as well. This tears down the inhibitions we have and the feelings we have. What does that look like? It looks like acting on our faith. It looks like putting God first. It looks like saying, God, I want to experience you and ask him by his Holy Spirit to touch you. The power of God is so great and it's so wonderful that we feel. If I pinched you, you would say, ouch. The presence of the Holy Spirit, part of the work that he does, I believe, is that he makes us feel, that we feel his presence and we are moved to action because of that feel. I'm not talking about touchy-feely only. We believe the word of God, right? But the presence of God is to woo us, to pull us, to draw us closer to Jesus. So let's do that this morning. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.